How is everybody? Everybody doing well? All right, the few people. Well, the, hey, I don't know what it is, but like you guys like to be halfway back, right? You see, it's like we're very far. I don't know if I spit a lot or anything like that, but I'm glad that you're here this morning, and I want to welcome you. If this is your first time here with us at Milestone Church, we're super excited to have you with us today. It's an honor and privilege to have you with us, and uh, I pray that today would be an encouragement to you, and uh, we're really looking forward to the days ahead, what God has for us, and, and so we just need to continue to be in prayer. Um, you know as well as I do, like a lot of people are battling sickness and, and just, you know, this kind of craziness period that we're in dealing with COVID and all the ups and downs and the ebbs and flows. And, and so let's just be praying for one another, be encouraging one another. I shared with you last week about uh, Tony and Julie, gave you a little bit of update about them, J- Joni. Joni. Tony and Julie are a couple in our church, uh, very faithful people, been here for a long time at Milestone Church, uh, but the last three weeks have been very hard and difficult for the family. Uh, both of them ended up in the hospital uh, with COVID. Julie was in there about two weeks. Tony's still in the hospital. Uh, he was in the ICU unit, and, uh, but he's doing a little bit better. They did move him to a regular room, move him to the COVID floor, so that was uh, very significant. And so I would just ask that you continue to pray for them. Also, uh, you can be praying for uh, my mom. She's battling with that right now and, and not feeling very well. And uh, Patricia just got over it. And Missy just got over it a few weeks ago. And so anyway, it's kind of a crazy time. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of the season that we're in and learning to live with it and deal with it. But I am say all that to say that I'm super glad that you are here this morning, and uh, we can't wait to see what God's going to do. I want to encourage you each and every week to invite somebody, bring somebody with you. As you can see, we've got plenty of space, and and uh, we would love to have those seats f- filled. And so anybody you think of, uh, any friends, any family, uh, whenever you get an opportunity where you're at the grocery store, you're at the bank, it's always an opportunity. You never know what God is going to open up and what opportunity that you may have to invite somebody. And I tell you what, there's nothing more exciting to me anyway that when you invite somebody and they come and, and, and when ultimately, you know, maybe God moves and touches and changes their life and changes their heart. That's just so exhilarating, so exciting. So listen, I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, my prayer, my heart is that each and every week that you come, that you would be encouraged and uh, that uh, Jesus would be lifted up and glorified because that's why we do what we do, amen, is that we want Jesus to be lifted up. He said in John 12, 32, that if I be lifted up, I will draw all people unto me. And so that's our heart. That's our prayer. That's why we do what we do here at Milestone Church. So thanks for being here this morning. Um, I want to continue in our series. We're doing a series called This Is Us. And I asked you, like how many of you had seen the show, you may be familiar with the TV show, but it's just basically about a family, and this is not a parody off of that, it's just, we're just using the title, because uh, there's a correlation between us and them in the sense of that we are a church family, and we are the body of Christ. And, and we're talking, and we're taking a look in who we are, what we're about as a church. And so my heart and my prayer is that, that this would give you an ideal of where we're going, of where we're headed, and why we do what we do. I always tell people all the time, I don't want you to stick your hand in the cookie jar thinking you're going to get chocolate chip and pull out oatmeal raisin, okay? And so we want you to know what we're about and why we do what we do, our heart, our prayer, our intent as Milestone Church. And so we've just been kind of taking through these values, these steps that we believe uh, when we, it's a growth track to where that we can look and we can go and we can take next steps on our journey. And like I told you a few weeks ago, my heart and my prayer as your pastor, I believe my, my responsibility is to help you grow, help to take a next step. I want to take a next step because here's the truth of the matter is, is all of us are somewhere on our spiritual journey, right? We can all agree today, if you're here today and you're living and you're breathing and you're looking at me physically today, like you haven't arrived yet, right? Because we know that ultimately, eternally, we're going to be in our heavenly home, like we're going to be with the Lord one day and we're not going to deal with any more sickness. We're not going to deal with any more sorrow. It's not going to be any more sickness suffering, any pain. But when we get there, when we breathe our last breath, our spiritual destination, like we will finally arrive. But on here, like while we're on planet earth and while we still have a mission to fulfill, like we're all taking next steps. We're all somewhere on our spiritual journey. Like you may not be where you used to be,
be, or you may not be where you want to be, but you can look back and you can say, I'm not where I used to be, that I'm moving forward. And that's what Paul was talking about, that I'm striving, I'm looking forward to the prize of the high calling that God's placed in my life and understanding that I haven't arrived yet. And my heart and my prayer is as your pastor to help you take next steps as I take next steps of following Jesus, growing closer to Jesus each and every day, because I haven't got it all figured out. I haven't got it all together. And we're all in this journey together. And my heart, my prayer is that wherever you are, that you would just take the next step, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. For some of you, it may be coming into a personal relationship with Christ. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. But my heart, my prayer is that you would go down that path. And one of the verses that we've been looking at is Proverbs chapter 28 or chapter 29, verse 18. You have to change the background on that in order for them to, to see that right there. Um, there we go. All right. Everybody say this with me, okay? Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. It says, where there is no what? Say that word. Vision, where there is no vision. In other words, if I don't see the path clearly, in other words, the people perish, or you can even translate it like the people stumble all over the place. And isn't that how we feel like sometimes in life is that we're just kind of going from place to place, that we're just kind of stumbling through, fake it till you make it, right? And, but we need a clear path. We need a clear vision of who God's called us to be and what we're to do as Christ followers. And that's our heart and our prayer. Also, we've been looking in the book of Psalm chapter 92, and we've looked at this verse. We looked at it last week. It says, those what? Say that word with me. Planted. Those planted in the house of the Lord, they will what? Flourish in the courts of our God. And so listen, your environment matters. We've been talking about that. Your environment matters. So like being here on Sunday morning, it matters because this is a place to where that we study God's word together. That man, we preach and teach the gospel and we share how we can grow in our faith. And we talk about how the Bible applies to our lives, that it's not just a book that we read about. It's not just about some old stories that's been passed down generation to generation. It's God's living, breathing word and it's profitable for teaching. And and it's profitable for your life. It's profitable for your marriage. It's profitable for your family, just in your everyday life. And so it's important to be planted in the house of the Lord because when we're planted in God's house, not just coming to church, but when we're walking with Jesus every single day, the potential and opportunity is to flourish and to experience his grace, to experience his goodness, to experience his peace that he can only give. It doesn't mean that your life's going to be perfect. I want to communicate that it doesn't mean that you're never going to have to deal with difficulty it doesn't mean that you're not going to face sorrow in your life but when it does come and listen when you live and when you breathe it will come difficulty will come heartache will come suffering sorrow will come but if you're in the right environment and you're planted rooted deeply in God's love and God's grace and God's mercy your life can continue to flourish even though there's chaos all around you and that's good Good news, amen? That's good preaching too. Go ahead and say amen this morning, right? Amen? All right. I know it's early and I know you're tired a little bit, but let's have a little church this morning, okay? Let's look at our next verse this morning in Psalm 1611. Again, talking about a pathway, right? Scripture talks about this over and over again. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence, right? A part of taking next steps, a part of growing, and a part of following Jesus, right? Here is the reward for that, is the joy of his presence, all right? I want you to get that. I want you to understand that. Like, God's gift to you and I is him. That's the blessing, right? When we talk about living the blessed life, it's like walking with the Lord. It's like knowing that the Lord is with you, Right? Sometimes we kind of attach certain things of what it means to be blessed. And we are blessed in a wide variety of ways. Generally, we place blessings alongside of like possessions and material things and, and things that we own and things that we get to do and experiences that we get to have. But there's so much more to being blessed than just stuff, right? Really, the true gift is God's presence, is that the God of heaven, the one who spoke and this all came into existence, loves you and I and wants to have fellowship, wants to have a relationship with you and I. And so you will show me the way of life. In other words, God has a plan. God has a pathway. Granted me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you 
forever. And so what we've been talking about in this series, This Is Us, is that we, have, we believe that God's given us a pathway, right? We believe that as we look in Scripture, we can find these things. These are biblical. These are Scripture. And, and so we have just kind of reworded it a little bit, and we kind of put it in four phrases or four statements to where that you can take a next step. And we believe that everybody's on a spiritual journey. And we don't know where each and every individual is, but everybody needs to take a next step. And so I just want to kind of talk about what those steps are. And I want you guys to say it with me. And we talk a lot about this here at Milestone Church. The first thing our heart is for everybody to say it with me is what? Know God. In other words, it's just simply that. Our heart and our prayer is that every single person that we come into contact with has a personal relationship with Jesus. It's the most important thing that you could ever have or ever do in your life is to come to a personal place and moment in time to where that you realize that you have fallen short of the glory of God, that every single one of us have sinned, but Jesus made a way. Because of our sin, we deserve to be separated from God. But as I said a moment ago, Jesus made a way. He went to the cross. He shed his blood. He literally died, was buried, resurrected from the dead, right? And that, and because of that moment, because of that event, by faith, when we call out to him, when we ask him to forgive us, Jesus is faithful to forgive us, and right, we're brought into a personal relationship. We can actually know God. I believe you can actually know God. I believe that with all my heart, that you can know that you know that you know that you know. And listen, you can't take any of these other steps until you know God. Right? You can't experience these things. Knowing God is first and foremost. You can't start at number two and work down to three and four. And again, it's like not, when I get to number four, it's not like I've arrived. Again, we're all still learning. We're all still growing. But this gives you a pathway. This gives you a grow track to where that you can begin to move in your faith. And the second thing is, as everybody said when we talked about this last week, is what? Find freedom. Look at your neighbor and say, find freedom. All right. I was going to tell you, look at your neighbor and say, man, you look good today. Look like you lost weight. And then I was going to tell you, look at the one you ignored and tell them, well, you found it. But I thought that might be mean, you know, so I, I thought we'd just keep a sweet spirit here this morning. But uh, find freedom. And what that means simply is, is that when you give your life to Jesus, right, you, it doesn't mean that, again, you, you still have junk. You're still dealing with bitterness. You're still in, with uh, strongholds that are on your life. Right? There's, there's things that we hold on to. There's things that we're dealing with. There's things that we're battling through. And when we talk about finding freedom, it doesn't mean that you'll never deal with sin again, right? I don't believe we can get to a point in place in our human lives to where that we don't deal with sin any longer. Every single one of us battle with that, right? We all have temptations. We all uh, are bombarded, bombarded from each and every side, but God wants us to find freedom and trusting in his grace and trusting in his goodness and understanding that it's not upon our performance, but it's upon his finished work on the cross is that that brought freedom into our lives. And that is good news. And God wants us to to find freedom so that ultimately we can discover purpose, right? It's hard to discover purpose when we're still dealing with like all this baggage that we have at moments and times. Like I'm talking about things and past things and some people are living in their past and having a hard time of pressing towards the future, but God has a plan and a purpose. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to center in on this one today. So ultimately that each and every person can make a difference, right? We know that the people that are most content, the people that are most fulfilled, right? These are just studies, not just with believers, but just people in general. People who believe that they are making a difference are the most content in life. And everybody wants to know that does what I do matter, right? Does what I do matter? And listen, I told you this is like, I want my life to count. The Bible says that life is like a vapor, that it's here for a while and then it's gone. Even if it's a hundred years, it's like this. And I want my vapor to count. I want to know that what I'm doing is making a difference. And I want to invest my life and I want to pour in that. And I want to build eternal things because those are the things that last forever. And so we're talking about discovering purpose. And I remember when I was probably around 20 or actually around 19 years old, I had just given my life to Christ. Even though that I was a PK, even though I was a preacher kid, I gave my life to Christ, and I just turned 19, and I start to deal with this intent, intense, not intent, but this intense like, gravitational pull 
And I really believed that God was calling me to ministry. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like. And to be honest, I didn't like it one bit. Because I'd already set out in my heart, in my mind, that the last thing that I was going to do would I would ever be in the ministry, right? My dad was a pastor, and that's what my dad did. That's not what, who I was. And I've talked to you about that, and you guys have been good counselors and listened to me. You know, being a BK, or Pete, not a BK, uh, we might have a little bit more cash if we was part of the BK family. But as a PK kid, you know, it's like we, uh, we you know, when you're in school, it's like uh, when you act up and when you do something, it's like, well, you're, your dad's a preacher, you know. And it's like, well, that's what my dad does. That's not who I am. So anyway, I tried to be the opposite of that. But when I gave my life to Jesus, even though that I'd been in the right environment, I was in the wrong condition, right? I'd heard about the gospel over and over and over again, but there's something significant that when Jesus really touches your heart, he touches your heart and he changed my life. And I, and I gave my life to Christ. And so around 19, I start to feel this pull that God's calling me in to ministry. And it scared me to death. Number one, I don't know if you know a whole lot about me. I've shared this with a lot of you before, but I was one of the most introverted people that you could ever be around. Like I was very self-conscious. I didn't like to be up in front of people. I took zeros when I gave a report at school. Like I would just take an F. Like I'm not going to do that. Like I would just get so weirded out about that. And so the ideal of being like up in front of people like terrified me. But I remember like God continued to have this call on my life. And so a few years, you know, kind of went here or there. And I, and I decided that I was going to go into secondary education because I wanted to teach school and I wanted to coach basketball. I love, love basketball. I love being a part of that and, and, and just like great memories, just love the game and all those different types of stuff. And so that's what I wanted to do. So I was going to school for that. And, and um, man, it just seemed like that it, God would not let this thing go. And so I started in student ministry. I said, well, I'll just start serving with the students at our church. You know, my dad was pastoring and start serving in the students. And, and we didn't, you know, really have a lot of students at that particular time. And anyway, just started loving on the kids in the community. And uh, before you know it, like, man, we were growing, we were reaching kids and people were giving their life to Jesus. And like our, our ministry on Wednesday nights was growing. And we started out with about five kids and, and two of those were my brother and sister. My dad made them come. So like they had no, no choice. And, and, and so, but like, you know, we, we got to where like we were having like a hundred kids on Wednesday night. Now listen, there's nothing to do. In, I started in Sunbright and there's nothing to do in Sunbright. I don't know if anybody's from Morgan County. I lived there for several years. Love that. That's why we have a church campus in Morgan County because I've always had a heart for Morgan County. But I mean, when we had over a hundred kids, but I just remember sitting there thinking as I was beginning to grow and teaching the Bible and I was becoming God, it was God's confidence, right? It wasn't like, Hey, I can do this. My, I just get sick and nervous every time before I'd get up there and speak. But it was just like when God would move and God would minister to people, I would begin to have this thought like I was made for this. This is what I'm supposed to do. Right? You know, I, yeah, I love basketball, and yes, I wanted to teach school, but like I get to coach the best team in town right here. Man, there's so much potential, there's so much opportunity. And I really began to discover that this is who God created me for. But I think the problem a lot of times is, is that people who are sitting out there, I happen to be on stage right now, and again, I've said this moments in time, that I just happen to be the pastor here. Like, this is, this is my role in the body of Christ. This is my role in particular here at this church. It's not any more important than the person who greets at the door. It's not any more important than the person who is leading children's ministry and loving on kids and lifting up the name of Jesus. It's just the part that I get to play. It's just the call that God has on my life. And here's what I want you to know is sometimes we think that if God is going to use me, that I have to be on stage in order for God to use me. No, God needs people everywhere. He needs people on stage. He needs people behind the scene. But however he's wired you, however he's designed you, God has a purpose for your life. And when you discover that and when you begin to experience that, you too can say, you know what? I was made for this. Like when I really truly understand that there is something significant about what I get to be a part of, it's not a task that I'm doing, but man, I'm helping build the kingdom of God. Like I was made, I was designed for this. 
And that's good news for each and every one of us. And so I wanted to just to kind of share, if you guys are with me, say I am. I want to make sure, is anybody asleep? If they are, elbow them, wake them up, all right? And uh, lock the door back there, okay? i got about 15 minutes, all right? So listen, I'm going to get you out of here on time today. Say amen about that. All right, if you believe that I'm telling the truth when I say that, say amen. All right, a few people. Okay, all right, good. I thought it was going to be dead silent because, you know, like when the preacher says one more point, like you know there's like four or five more, right? I'm hurrying, all those different types of things. But I want to talk to you a little bit about like enemies of purpose. Like what are some of the barriers that keep us from discovering our purpose? Okay, now listen, I want you to know the Bible describes us as the body of Christ, okay? So I want you to think about that. A lot of times when we, we think about the church, like, you know, if I were to ask you, you know, when I say the church, what comes to your mind? What picture comes to your mind? A lot of times people will talk about a building, like that, that's the church, and that's where God lives, and, you know, we kind of have this thought process that, you know, God lives in the building. But listen, again, one of the great things about being portable is we know that God is not confined, confined to a location, amen? It's when God's people gather together. There, His presence there is in the midst of that. But we are a body of Christ, and everybody, like there's, when you look at a body, right, really we should just draw a person. There's fingers, there's toes, there's eyes, there's ears, there's noses, like in every Every, every member of the body like has a purpose, right? Even, even the ones sometimes you don't think like that or, or that big of a deal. Like, you know, you're, you, you would think like maybe a big toe, like it helps you keep your balance and, and, and things of that nature. Or like if you have had COVID, like and you've lost your smell or taste, anybody lose their smell or taste? Okay, anybody still having trouble smelling and tasting? Like, I had it in September, and I still can't smell or taste. Actually, it's kind of nice, because, like, you can just eat anything, and, like, you can go in any environment, and you're good. Everybody else may have a hard time with it, but, like, you're good with it. You can eat liver and onions and not worry about it, you know. Anybody like liver and onions? All right, a few people, all right. My brother, he would always kill me if we go to Shoney. Sometimes he'll order liver and onions. It's, it's gross. But even if I can't taste it, I still wouldn't eat it. But anyway, let's talk about enemies of purpose. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And you can follow along the screen, or if you've got your Bible, you can highlight this. this is, but it says, don't copy. Right? See that word right there? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you what? Think. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So two words there. It says don't copy. In other words, uh, one translation says don't conform to the pattern of this world. There is a system of belief. There is a way of thinking that culture has. And it's like this makes your life meaningful. This makes your life purposeful, right? And it says don't buy into that, right? Don't, don't just think of, of, of ultimately finding a position at some company and obtaining things, right? Is that's going to give you meaning. That's going to give you purpose. But what happens when we allow God to transform us is that he begins to change the desires of our heart. And, and we begin to see what our true purpose is. And a lot of times people have a hard time of identifying what their purpose is because of a few things. And so you can write these down if you're taking notes. The first thing is confusion plays a part. Confusion. In other words, a lot of times people don't even know what their purpose is. People don't even know what their spiritual gift is. So just let me say this to you today, that if you are a believer in Jesus, in other words, there was a point and place in time to where that you asked God to forgive you of your sin, you placed your faith and trust in him, God saved you, God forgave you, I believe that with all my heart. And at that moment, here's what I want you to know, God's spirit begins to dwell in you and God gifted you for ministry. You can look at your neighbor and say, God gifted you. Now look at the ghost next to you right there and say, God gifted you too. All right. God gifted you for ministry. God gifted you. You have a spiritual gift. Now sometimes people have more than others, and we're not going to uh, talk about all the different gifts today and everything. And at some point in time, I'll probably do a sermon on that and talk about that, each one. But it's important that you find and discover what your gift is. 
right? And sometimes people are confused about that. Like they don't, they don't even know. Some people don't even know that they're gifted for ministry. They don't even know that God has gifted them in that way. And so there's confusion. And you know what the scripture says about confusion is that God is not the author of confusion. God's desire, God's heart is not for you to be confused about it. God wants you to discover it and God wants you to know so that ultimately you can thrive in where he has planted with you so that you can touch and so that you can be a blessing to others. Amen? The second thing is not only confusion, but there's also comparison. What keeps people from discovering and living in and out their gifts is they constantly compare themselves to other people. Do you know what happens when people compare themselves? Nobody wins. Nobody wins. Because, listen, no matter in which way you compare yourself to someone else, there's always somebody who does something worse than you, and there's always somebody who does something better than you. And it's a no-win situation. Nobody wins. And oftentimes, you know, we say, well, you know, I can't speak or I can't play and I can't sing. And we sometimes think that those are the only things that you can do in the body of Christ. And there is so much more. There are so many gifts that are needed, so many gifts that are necessary. And God's designed each and every one of us uniquely, differently. And listen, it's important that we don't compare ourselves to one another. Understand that, listen, God designed me this way. God wants to use my design. God wants to use my giftedness, whatever that is. And that's why it's important that you discover your purpose. Because, listen, some of you, like, you know, you're missing because, like, the body can't function. Imagine. Listen, I read statistics the other day. It said like 87% of the church doesn't know their purpose, doesn't know their giftedness, doesn't know how they're wired, how God designed you. Now think about it. What if 80% or 87% of your body didn't function? You'd probably, depending on what those things are, you probably wouldn't be able to do a whole lot. You might even be dead, anemic, a lot of different things. Now think about the body of Christ. Like it's important that you discover your purpose. And so don't compare yourself, right? A lot of times, you know, we're, or, 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 or sometimes, you know, we, 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 we look at that and, and we feel like we have nothing to bring, nothing to offer, okay? And so the third thing that we also see that it can be a barrier, that can be an enemy of purpose, is not only confusion, but also a counterfeit. In other words, we try to be somebody that we're not. Like one of the hardest and most important things, I say what, one of the most difficult things that I had to learn how to do was be Robert. Like I said, my dad was a preacher, so when I first started preaching, I preached like my dad. And you know who my dad preached like? He listened to Adrian Rogers all the time. I don't know if any of you guys know who Adrian Rogers is, but if there ever was a preacher voice, it was his voice. I mean, he had that deep commanding. I mean, it was just like beautiful when he taught, like, I loved to, I loved to listen to him. Right. But I, 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 I tried to kind of mold and shape and, and, and kind of be that. But the problem was, is that that wasn't who I am. And I believe that the greatest gift that I could give our church is be me, be comfortable in who God designed me to be and share and preach and teach how God designed me to preach and teach and not to be somebody else. And I think a lot of times we're wanting somebody else's portion when God said, listen, I've got a specific portion for you. I've got a calling placed on your life. And the greatest thing that you can do and the greatest thing that you can give this body is yourself. And learning that and being comfortable with that and not trying to be a counterfeit. Don't try to be something that you're not. And I think so many times we get hung up and we get caught up into that. Well, let's talk about some quick things here. I've got four quick things. It's about 18 after 11. So again, you guys getting out on time is totally up to you. If you listen fast, you will get out on time, okay? All right, cool. Can we do that together? Amen. Let's talk about how God reveals our purpose, how God reveals our purpose. And when you look through scriptures, I think there's some things that we can see, and I think there's some things that we can understand. Let's look at the first one, is that we have a call from birth, a call from birth. And I want to share with you, and, and when I look at this particular passage of scripture, it's in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Listen to what scripture says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. 
Alas, sovereign Lord. This is Jeremiah speaking back. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young, right? Isn't that how we do sometimes? God said, listen, I've got a calling on your life. I want to use you in this manner. And listen, let me ask, let me tell you this. Oftentimes when God brings you in to ministry, whatever that is, whatever that looks like, there's going to be times and moments to where that he stretches you, to where that it's uncomfortable. But you know what? It's important to be stretched. It's important to be uncomfortable. When God called me to preach, it was the best, worst place to be because I was so uncomfortable comfortable. And I had to get over myself, right? I had to get over my excuses and trying to tell God why I couldn't do this, how I wasn't good enough to be able to do this, and how I was petrified in doing what he had called me to do. But ultimately, I would just move in that direction, right? Sometimes it would be a tiny step. Sometimes it would be a big step. But whenever I would take a step in moving forward, I would always say, Lord, you're going to have to show up and do something, Lord, I'm just going to have, Lord, you're going to have to move in my heart. Lord, you're going to have to touch my lips. You're going to have to use my mouth. Lord, help me grow. Help me mature. Like, and I know this, that God is faithful, just like the song that we sang. Faithful you are. God truly is faithful. And sometimes, listen, it's important that you are stretched even to the point of breaking, right? God wants to break you. That's not very comfortable talking about, is it? You know, when we think about, like, we want, we want God to make us comfortable, we don't like the idea of God like breaking us, but God wants to break you so that he can bless you, so that he can continue to grow you in your walk with him. And so it's important to understand that, listen, God has a call on your life from the very get-go, from birth. The second thing that we can see is understanding is that you have a purpose, right? You, you have a call that has been placed upon you before you were even born. God knew you, and God knew me, and God had a plan, and God had a purpose for our life. The second thing is, is that we need to continue to have a growing awareness. And here's what I mean by that. How many of you are familiar with the story of Joseph? Anybody? Raise your hand. Go ahead. Participate. All right, cool. Most people. Some people may not, and it's okay. And if you don't, you can go back and you can read about Joseph. I believe it starts around chapter 35 of the book of Genesis. It goes all the way through the end of Genesis. And so it's a great, great, wonderful story. Actually, true story, right, about Joseph who was loved by his father, right? He was kind of deemed special. Uh, he was the youngest. His dad loved him. His dad made him a coat of many colors, and he kind of flashed it around before his brothers. And uh, they just didn't really like like Joseph. And then Joseph had this dream. God had a call on his life and he was giving him a vision of who he was going to be and what God was going to do in his life. And he was going to rule over his brothers. And so Joseph decided it would be a good idea to say, hey, to his brothers, hey, listen, I had this dream. And guess what God said? I'm going to be your boss. Like, I'm going to rule over you. Now, if you, how many of you are older brothers? Anybody older brother, older sister in here? Like, you know, if your little brother comes up and they start talking all that jazz, like, you're going to let them know what the pecking order is, right? It's like, hey, listen, you know, you ain't there yet. Just going to remind you that, like, I'm still your older brother. I'm still your older sister, right? And so Joseph's brother, like, they were furious. They were already mad at him, but they were furious. And so they sold him into slavery, right? Sent him off. They were going to kill him. They decided, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't do that. Let's sell him into slavery. They sent him off. And you can imagine, like, Joseph had all these thoughts, right? God, listen, I had this dream. Lord, I know without a doubt that it was you that said I was going to be in a leadership position, but now I'm in prison. And I've been sold off to be a slave. And now I'm serving at Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife is making up lies about me. And now I'm thrown into prison again. And then there's a cupbearer and a baker down there. And I interpret their dreams, but they don't remember me. And I'm in this prison cell for so long. And you can imagine he probably thought, like, well, maybe what God has for me isn't so. Sometimes we, we think that we don't have an awareness. Sometimes we think that, like in our calling, that everything is going to work out the way that we think that it should work out. Nothing, when you read the passage of Scripture about Joseph's life, right, nothing worked out according probably to the plan that he had created in his mind. Everything was completely opposite, but there came a time. And here's what I want you to understand is that you need to have a growing awareness that just because something negative happens in your life, just because something bad happens in your life, it doesn't mean that God is trying to get you. 
It doesn't mean that God is trying to destroy you, that God is trying to just get rid of you, that he is going back on his plan, going back on his purpose in your life. God will allow you and I to go through difficulty. I need you to know that. Sometimes we use Jesus as a rabbit's foot that we stick in our pocket. And we think that if I read a psalm a day, that it keeps the devil away. And I do all these things, right? I just go and I can do this and I'm not going to have any difficulty. But Jesus said, in this life, you will have what? You will have tribulation. You will have trouble, right? And that word trouble is like deep agony, like the kind that keeps you up at night. In this life, you will have trouble. But he says, take heart, for I have overcome the world. But here's what I want you to know. It's not that God won't give you any more than you can handle. And the fact of the matter is God will give you more than you can handle. But in the process of not being able to handle it, do you know where we turn to? To the Lord, because ultimately God wants us and our dependence to be on him because he is able. Like we have to get to that point to where, Lord, I can't, but you can. And so we go through difficulty in life. We go through seasons that are hard. But listen, here's the thing that I want you to remember is that God doesn't waste our pain. He doesn't waste our pain. And Joseph had a growing awareness as he continued to trust the Lord in the midst of difficulty. And when you read in Genesis chapter 50, I believe it's chapter 50, And it's found in verse 20. Joseph is finally standing before his brothers. And they don't even really know that it's him. There's famine that had entered into the land. Joseph has now went from prison to where he's become second in command in Egypt. There's been famine all throughout the land. And and Joseph's brothers have now come before him. He's dressed like an Egyptian. He's dressed in royalty, right? They have no idea or no clue that this is their brother. And Joseph begins to reveal himself to them. The Bible says that he begins to weep and he begins to cry. That, you know, he could have said, you know, grabbed him by the shirt or grabbed him by the throat and said, now vengeance is mine. But he doesn't do any of that because Joseph had a growing awareness that God allowed me to go through every single moment, every single difficulty, everything that I went through, everything that I endured brought me right here to this place in this moment. And now I'm in a position to where that I can help and I can minister to my brothers and my family. And I want you to think about that. Everything that you have went through, everything that I have went through in life, God will not waste that pain. God will use it for good. God will use it for his glory. Because Joseph began to be aware, and this is what he told his brothers. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for what? good. You meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. And God will allow us to go through difficulty. Like if you've been through the fire in your marriage and you're still standing, God will redeem that moment. God will redeem that difficulty. And you can help other people who are going through a difficult season. If you've lost somebody, if you've been through the fire and you don't have, like you, you, it was just a very difficult time, but some way, somehow God brought you out on the other side. God will not waste that pain. God will redeem it and God will use it for his glory to minister to others. The third thing, if you guys are still with me, say I am. Two more things real quick. So we got to have a growing awareness. We've got to understand that just because difficulty happens, it doesn't mean that God is done with us, right? God is still working. God is moving, and we've got to be aware of what he's doing around us. The third thing is, is like when God gives us opportunity, We've got to walk through open doors, right? Scripture talks about that when God opens a door, nobody closes it. And when he closes it, nobody can open it, right? It's very important that we get that. It's very important that we understand that, right? If you read the scripture of an account about Esther, and I don't have time to explain all of it today and go through each moment, but basically Esther wins a beauty contest. She's now the wife of the king. But her uncle reminds her that, listen, you didn't win this contest just so that you could be queen and setting up on the throne because there was a decree out to kill the Jewish people, and she's from the Jewish race. And it's really a testimony of God's faithfulness and God's goodness and his fulfilling his promise. 
But listen, they're telling her and they're reminding her, they said that if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. In other words, when God's got a desire, when God's got a plan, if it's his will, like if we don't, some way, somehow, it's going to come about. You can't stop God. He can open any door that he wants to open and he can close any door that he wants to close. And when he opens it, nobody can close it. And when he closes it, nobody can open it. But it said it'll rise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Right? Here's what I believe. Like, it's hard to navigate in this season of COVID, right? As the church, there's a lot of things changed in the last couple of years. There's a lot of things, but I believe that God's put his church here. God's put you and I here for such a time as this. To be hope in darkness. To be light. To lift up and to love others. And to lift up the name of Jesus. Walking through open doors. God's placed people all around you. And here's the last thing. The fourth thing of how God reveals our purpose. We talked about we have a call from birth. We're to grow in awareness around us. Walking through doors of opportunity that God opens and gives us. We can't be afraid to do that. But we also need a God encounter. You need, you need that moment. I remember when, when God was putting it in my heart to, to start this church. I remember I called my wife. I was in Missouri. Like I'd been thinking about it, kind of been praying about it. But it's like there was confirmation that particular night. And I remember God speaking some things into my heart and in my life. And like it was a defining moment. There's been other defining moments throughout the years. I know like another defining moment for, for what we're all in. It was like a, a little over a year ago, you know, like we, we decided as a church that we were going to sell our building and, and we were going to come here to the unknown. We didn't have a place, but we believe that God's going to give us a place. And man, I, I'm thankful that we're here at Robertsville. And I don't know what God's going to do in the next several days. I don't know what he's going to do in the next month, but I know that what he has and I'm believing what he has is good. But here's the deal. A building does not determine whether or not we reach people. A building doesn't determine whether or not, man, we're going to take next steps and follow him and experience his grace and his goodness. It doesn't determine any of those things. It's a tool that God gives us to use, and right now we've got this tool, and I believe we ought to use it to the best of our ability. And we can do everything that we can do, and I believe we should do everything that we can do, and what we look at and we know that are effective ways to, to minister and, and to connect with people. I mean, I believe we ought to greet to the best of our ability. I believe we ought to have coffee and those different things. But listen, nobody gets saved because coffee, right? Nobody gets saved because uh, somebody said hello to them. It, it helps create a conducive environment. Nobody gets saved because the sermon's preached. What changes people is when people encounter a personal, real God, and God touches their heart. We get to be conduits to help them connect to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But what everybody needs is a true, personal encounter with God. And I believe that's what God wants to do today here in this place today. I believe He wants you to know Him personally. I believe He wants you to encounter Him. And I'm reminded as I'm closing in Acts chapter 9, this is verses 1 through 6. And I'll just read it to you. I want you to think about it. God could have chose anybody to go and plant churches, to write two-thirds of the New Testament, right? All these great accomplishments, but He chose some guy by the name of Saul who was a murderer, who wasn't even a believer, but God in his foreknowledge knew who Saul was going to become, that later on he would become Paul, and then rather than destroying the church, he would build the church, he would share the gospel, preach and teach, he would suffer greatly because of it. But it says this, Meanwhile, as Saul was on this journey, he had asked 
Like, give me more power. I want to go out and I want to eliminate these people who are following Jesus. In other words, it said people of the way, as we may read about. But it says, meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest and he requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. And they're referring to those as followers of Jesus. He found there, he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. And as he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light came from heaven, suddenly shone down around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, and this is Jesus speaking, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul answers, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And listen to what he says. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. Very significant encounter that Saul had on that day. And it radically changed his life. Now, Saul didn't just get up the next day and just immediately go out. And then there was a time of training. There was a time of preparation. He prepared himself for what the Lord had called him to do. But at that moment in time, he discovered that he was made for that. He was made for more. And he lived his life to the fullest of exalting and lifting up and making much about the name of Jesus. And it's one of the reasons that we have the scriptures today. We benefit because of his calling, because of his ministry. And let me tell you something. When, if you ask anybody about Saul back in the day, in his time and period, they would say that God would never use anybody like that. But yet God changed the world with a guy who was willing. And I believe this as I look around today, like God wants to change the city of Oak Ridge, the communities, Rome County, the, city, the counties around us, Anderson County, right? I believe that God wants to use us to bring about that change. And we've got to understand that he goes before us, that he goes with us. And whatever our gift is, some may have more than others. Some may be greater than others in our eyes. But listen, when we give whatever we have to the Lord, he makes much of it. And he uses it for his kingdom and his glory today. And my heart and my prayer is that you don't allow the barriers to keep you from being where God wants you to be. Maybe you haven't signed up for Stepping Sons. I'd love for you to take it. Join us week two next week at the Civic Center, 630. We dive in a little bit deeper. But listen, our heart and our prayer is that we want to give you the opportunity, the tools and resources to be able to grow. But ultimately, God wants you to use your life for him because he's faithful and good. And we're going to sing a song right now. I want you to stand with me. If you guys are still with me, say, I am. Now, listen, I tell you this every week. They're not up here to give a performance. We're family. We're not the audience. God is the audience this morning. We sing to him because he is good. We sing for his glory. So open your mouth, lift your voice to the Lord. This is a beautiful song talking and reminding us about the goodness of God. And God's been so gracious and good, and I believe that one of the ways that we can honor Him is by living for Him and using our God-given purpose for His kingdom. If you need to come this morning and you don't know Jesus, you've never accepted Jesus, I invite you to come, right? We, we call this an altar up here, and there's nothing wrong with being up here. Maybe some of you need prayer today, and you're just like going through a difficult time, and you just want to pray. You've got a burden you're carrying. You pray. Maybe you're just praying for somebody else. Whatever that is, whatever that looks like. Man, we just pray that there would be a freedom in this place today. So let's get ready and let's lift our voice to the Lord. And if you need to take a next step or you need to come this morning.